Welcome, everybody. It's so nice uh, to see so many of you. I'm Rachel Corp, CEO of ITN, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this Women in Journalism event. Uh, to slightly confuse you, it's held in ITV's auditorium, so thank you to ITV. And thank you to our friends and our clients for collaborating with us at ITN on what promises to be a fantastic fireside chat no fireside, we've got a plants, plant side oh, oh. chat, um, with two absolutely brilliant women of journalism, uh, Lorraine Kelly and Daily Mirror editor Alison Phillips, who is also the current chair of Women in Journalism. Like all good journalists, we did a bit of research earlier today and discovered that Women in Journalism was founded in 1992 by the powerhouse journalist Eve Pollard. And it was that year that Betty Boothroyd was elected Speaker to the House of Commons. Mm -hmm. Gary Lineker was still playing football. <laughs> and Whitney Houston was number one uh, oh. back when that actually mattered. Um, the evidence around us, I hope, would suggest that life has changed dramatically in many ways, but research conducted just last year showed that 74% of the 1,200 UK journalists surveyed said they still find the culture of media organisations to be macho and intimidating. And it's clear that the need for organisations like Women in Journalism is as strong as ever. And it's by hosting events like this and panel discussions and networking events with mentorships and undertaking research that came up with those stats. The, women of, the mission of women in journalism is to not only change the narrative, but the reality of our workplaces as well, and really create a truly inclusive atmosphere in our profession. And surely that's the only way that we are going to thrive. It's really, really important work that echoes everything we're striving for at ITN, and certainly for me as an editor, a huge priority over the last few years. So let's get on with it. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us, and over to you. Thank you very much, Rachel, and uh, welcome to Lorraine. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. We, it's a real treat, I think, in women in journalism. One of the, the important things that we try to do a lot is to inspire women coming into the profession or in their earlier years and in the job. And I think in, in, that seeing people that have really made it and have really made it through the tough times is an inspiration, so thank you. But I think we're going to start by watching a little mm -hmm. highlight. It's like Gosh. at the end of Big Brother <laughs> where we do that bit. So here's your best bits. Lorraine is waiting to take up all the issues that you have brought up in this interview. Thank Lorraine. you very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Lorraine. Lorraine's a legend. I'm just so happy to be here with Lorraine. I'm with Lorraine. You're looking absolutely rubbishingly beautiful this morning. I don't look like this when I watch you at home, by the way. <laughs> He says he calls you the Dean and he curtsies at you. I do, I, I curtsy to it, I bow every morning. Mixing a mean Negroni is very yeah. important. And obviously that helps with hangovers too. 100%. This is Alan well, Patrick. Well, everyone has an Alan Mo. So. You've done that before. <laughs> I've done that before. <laughs> you, you have, memorably. You've done that before, it's a cracker. <laughs> She's never had an orgasm. Never, never, never. 15% of women have never had an orgasm. Seriously? Give Victoria a phone and get her to do your fantastic outfit. Yeah, Victoria. Yeah, just say, come on. What will I wear? We could go shopping, but we're coming. <laughs> well, you can give me some tips. I'll you can give tips. me some tips. A headband, a pair of dark glasses, lipstick, earrings. Done. I really like the relationship with your character and the Queen. Yes. There's more to it than, than we know, I think. I think yes. we find out a lot more about that. Yes. Oh, oh my God! I was on death's door. Something just told me that I'm going to I'm going to die. I'm going to not wake up. And I remember crying, wishing I didn't. You're still standing. Yes, so you're, still, still, you're still here. You'll get a flicker of the old Derek. And in that instance, you go back to feeling like you're together. And then the next minute, he's gone again. What shines through is how much you love each other. Check yourself. Know what your normal is. So if something unusual pops up, you know to get it checked. Are we so silly when it comes to our bottoms? There should be no embarrassment when it comes to talking about our bowel health. So this morning we have a Dame Deborah. I love the ring that has to it. Dame Deborah update. Her Bell Babe fund has now raised over seven million now. She's incredible. She is. She just never stops and she's always got that smile on her face. We'll change. 
What I think you do is speak the British people up and speak up the goodness in the world. Rob for Prime Minister, that's what I say. He says no. Only 3% of people think that you're going to be Prime Minister one day. Do you think you will be? Do you think you've got any chance at all of one day getting the top job? <laughs> yes, I do. You're still very much involved with politics, of yes. course you are. Um, but you're, you're out the sort of day to day. Yes, politics. I'm, I'm, I'm off the front line, I'm on the back bench. Yes, yeah. can <laughs> I just say you look about 10 years younger? I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> Whenever I go into schools, and I see the young people and say, there is only ever going to be one you on this planet, ever. You're so unique. Celebrate who you are and don't let anybody tell you any different. I like that. That's a very optimistic note to end on. And I think just watching that show, as well, it is so interesting that the, the breadth of people that you do, oh, don't you, from the, so and lucky. on your show, all, all the sort of from the really quite serious news that you've got Angela Rayner and Keir Starmer there, right the way through to the lightest of light. So, so tell us, really, I think we're going to start with a very broad question. <laughs> what is the point of journalism? Why do you do it? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And um, when I was little, that's all I ever wanted to do. You know, I used to write wee stories um, and I was always, I think my mum said I came out of her saying why. And I just <laughs> never stopped saying why. And it's the curiosity thing. You yes. know, I'm just curious about everything. And you'd never, ever want to, to lose that. It'd be really sad if you got so cynical that you weren't curious about anything or you got so blasé or, you know, you got... It's, it's so important to hold on to that. It's just I want to find out everything. And that's why I think this job is so good because I do get to do just about everything. Yes. I don't really think... There is another show where we do that, you yes. know, and, and, but from a women's perspective as well, you know, because there are other shows that do lots and lots of different things, but we always tend, I mean, we, we do have men watching, of course we do, yes. but, you know, we, we do tend to always try and think about the women's point of view, how this will affect women. I mean, we saw Angela Rayner there, she actually came on the show that day, and I'll never forget it, and she, she wore a trouser suit because she felt uncomfortable yes. about showing her legs after yes. all the furore. I thought that's outrageous in this day and age that yeah. she feels like that. I mean, it was great that she was able to articulate it. Mm. That was at least somewhere, you know, we were getting somewhere. But at the same time, I mean, that yeah. was crazy. But when people are sort of perhaps more junior in, in their careers, having the confidence to keep asking that why, or even like as a young child, lots of people are curious by nature, but they find the actual... the asking yes. so did you did you have that curiosity but it came with an inner confidence you think i don't think it was confidence i think i was lucky my mum and dad were only 17 when they had me mm -hmm. and they were very very young and all of my friends their mums and dads felt like a different generation yes almost like um black and white as opposed to colour. Yes. I always thought my mum and dad were like, do you know, that? I know that Young. sounds mad, yeah. but they listened to the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and yes. Melanie and all of these things and Bob Dylan yes. and, and Dusty Springfield. And I was surrounded by that growing up. And my mum and dad, although they never had very much, I mean, we were from the Gorbals and, yes. you know, one wee room in an outside toilet, you know, boo-hoo, but we, but we were, but I never thought there was anything, you know, that's no, just the way you yeah. are. But my mum and dad uh, taught me to read and write before I went to school. They went. Mm -hmm. They weren't pushy in that sense, because very working class Scottish, yes. and they weren't pushy, but it was all education, 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 yeah. to quote mm -hmm. someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, um, that gave me such a lot. You know, that gave me, I wouldn't say I was confident, because I really wasn't. Um, and I did get bullied at school for being a smart arse. No, mm -hmm. I wasn't a smart arse, but I was perceived to be because I could read and write. Yes. And also it was a very, very poor uh, area that we lived in, and my mum and dad they made sure I went to school immaculate. I might yeah. as well have heard a sign up saying, kick the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great because I, I, and I was really interested and I had brilliant teachers. Yes. I, had, but that, I think that was the thing. We had, again, very young teachers. You know, they were only in their early 20s. Um, and they, they were there because they wanted to be there and they wanted to make a difference. You know, they probably could have gone to some very posh school mm -hmm, in Glasgow or something. Mm -hmm. But they came to our school in the East End. And if you showed any sign of, of curiosity or interest or, or, or whatever, they nurtured you. Mm. And that's I think that's so, so important. You've got to give back. And they really did. Because obviously, the, you know, the Gorbals in Glasgow was at that time really known as quaint you know, little quite fishing a, village, <laughs> a rough area. I mean, it was one of the people that was constantly sort of referred to and joked to. And, and I think you sort of grew up. Was, was your mother Catholic and your father Protestant? Yeah, when my you're mum in a died. very sectarian they, area. They, they, they were. They, they, it was called a mixed marriage. How Which utterly was, bizarre is that? I know. Um, and you know that there was a lot of problems with that. You know, with with my mum because my mum was uh, brought up in a convent. Yeah. And my dad was this. Wee and they, have they come over from yeah. Ireland? Yeah. Oh, a lot. That'd yes, they would have a long time. Both right. both sides uh, of the family would have yeah. been different sides yes. of the divide. Yes. You know, and and that was bizarre because I would be playing with kids until we were five, and 
then we went to school and then I never saw them again until we were fighting. It was awful. It was absolutely awful. And sadly and tragically, still to this day goes on. Not, not as bad absolutely. as it was, but it does. But, it, it does and but do you think also, me. though, that kind of like um, childhood, those experiences were part of what made you sort of think that there's was, there was always differences? Totally. And that you, and that Absolutely. you were looking for those differences and comfortable Absolutely. with those differences. Absolutely. And also, it was always the thing with me is, it's not that I wasn't impressed by people. I really am. And like, I, I was talking to a duchess today and I still get a little bit kind of, you know, yeah. that, which is ridiculous. But I think we're all a little bit like that. Yes. And there is a little bit of me that always thinks, you know, if I get invited to something posh, that somebody's going to come along and <laughs> say, <laughs> actually, they find you out and you have to go home now, um, which is mad. But I don't yeah. think you ever, you know, I, I think they call it imposter syndrome now, you know, but, you know, you can put a label on something or anything. But um, yeah, there is a little bit. A little bit of that, I think, that yes. still is there. Yeah. yeah, a wee bit. So then, so tell us then, um, into your career, at what point did you think, oh, I know what I want to do. I want to get paid for being curious and asking questions. Yeah, it was, it, I was very, very lucky. I was supposed to go to university and I would have been the first one in my family to I go. I bet your parents were desperate for you to go. Oh, listen, all they want, all working class Scottish parents want is to have a photograph on their mantelpiece yeah. of their kid with a hat on and the wee scroll. <laughs> They've made it and it's always like, come into the sitting room so you can see. And then they stand in front of the photo, you know, like showing off. That was the biggest deal. And of course, I, I hopefully, you know, mum and dad were like great stuff. Luckily, my wee brother did go. He was, a, you know, he was a genius. And so it's fine. They got the photo. Thank the Lord. Good. But I was going to go. I was going to go to university, weirdly, to, to do a Russian and English. Because I did but Russian at school. There was, that's uh, very I went unusual. to a massive, massive comprehensive school. It was about 1,200 pupils in the school. Um, and only three of us did Russian. So that's it was amazing. Incredible. It was incredible. I should have kept it up. Mm. I can't, um, it's, again, it's a confidence thing. Um, I did actually, many years ago, I went to New York to a vodka bar and there was a load of Russians in there and my Russian was brilliant, apparently. Nice. <laughs> By 3 a.m., I thought it was fantastic. I was, but apparently I was, yeah. you know, discussing everything yeah. and it must have all just come out there. But now I would be too, I would be way too shy. But... I was supposed to do that, and then, but then I saw in the East Kilbride News in the local paper, there was a little advert saying, you know, asking for cub reporters, as it were. So I, I applied and I was so lucky to, to get the job. And the great thing was that you worked um, on the paper for six months and then they put you to college in Edinburgh for right. six months to Napier mm -hmm. College. So you got the, all the benefits of being a student for a short amount of time, mm -hmm. knowing you had a job. Yes. I mean, come on. That's yes. that's amazing. And so there was no doubt in your mind that you wanted to do that rather oh, than go to Oh, absolutely. University. And I loved it. I yeah. absolutely loved it. This was in the days where, I mean, it was like something out of, I don't know if you've ever seen Life in Mars, where everything is, you know, that cop yeah. show, yeah. where everything yeah. is brown, yeah. you know, and you can't see for the fags and the smoke yeah. and all that. And that's what the that's what the office was like. I mean, it really was just a phone and a typewriter. But great with paper stories. in it. <laughs> and two fingers. And, but some of the stories at that point must have been great. Really good. And, and it was one of those jobs where you could sit in your bottom and uh, rewrite press releases, mm -hmm. you know. But who wants to do that? You know, you, you had to get out into the community and do things. And, I, and I, I worked there for about four or five years. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I, it, was, it was a brilliant learning curve. I ended up having my own page which yep. was fantastic. And, and I learned, and of course, then it was hot metal. You know, it was, yes. um, and if you made a mistake, you know, the printer had to get a chisel out and just... <laughs> you didn't make too many mistakes. <laughs> you didn't want to make too many mistakes. But I'm so glad that I had that opportunity to, to the smell of the... And, 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 and I think, is that amazing. the point where a lot of the confidence is built? Sort of because then you really do have to go out and ask. When you're still a very young person, you're going yeah. out and asking quite difficult questions yeah, of in quite you know, and, sensitive and, situations. Yeah, and hard, and hard things. But I always think you have to put, it's never about you, and this really goes for telly. It's, and, and a lot of people don't think like this, but I, I think it's so important to know it's not about you. It's about the person you're talking to and always try and, and sometimes you can't put yourself in their shoes because it's mm. too hard. You know, you, you, you don't know how Madeleine McCann's mum and dad are feeling, but you can sort of have an inkling and you need to make it about that person rather yeah. than you. And that goes for whatever story it might be. It might be talking to the winner of the Bonnie Baby competition that we used to have <laughs> in those days, used to have Bonnie Baby competition. Yeah. You know, and talking to the proud mum of the Bonnie Baby, but it's all about her and her baby and how she, you know. That's but it, it because it is exactly the same skill, it doesn't matter whether you're interviewing the Prime Minister or the winner of the Bonnie Baby competition. It's but, And you are I, 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 it's a consumer interviewer. And a lot of people can't do it because it, it sounds... It's on paper quite an easy thing to do, but actually it's really quite difficult when you see somebody do it badly I guess. and they don't get any. Yeah. So what, beyond that point you make about it's not about you, 
What is the trick, do you think, for good interviewing? Oh, you've got to do your homework. It's all mm-hmm. about homework. I mean, I still, I always say to I always say to I'm away to do my homework. Um, because if you're doing an interview with somebody for five or six minutes, it, you have to do as much work yes. as it might be for for an hour. You know, you, you do. And, and that's part of the job that I really enjoy. I really enjoy thinking about that. And what I do is I just have in my head... I've got a rough idea of how it's going to go, yeah. but I never stick to that. Yes. It's all, all about being flexible, especially if you're especially if you're talking to, I suppose it's more with actors. I mean, with politicians, it's like a dance, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, a, it, yeah. and especially now. I mean, I remember back when I worked at TVAM, we would get the Minister of State and the Shadow in, yes. both of them. At the same time. At the same Gosh, time, both of them. You and I, I think it's appalling that they don't do that now. No. I don't know when that switch was flicked that they don't do it because no because the the viewers the people the real people that matter need to know need Mm. to see this need Mm. to see it i I think they just all got i don't i I hate that aspect of that the control is going back to them you know that that boris johnson can hide in a fridge and not yeah 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 yeah, absolutely um i don't that's not right because they then supposing you do have um an interviewee the prime minister or whoever and (laughs) they are really stonewalling and you just can't quite pin them down you get to that awfully frustrating bit in an interview what do you what's your tactic then i would be well i remember it's not it wasn't a politician and um, it, it was uh, an actor rafe fines the actor oh yeah ralph very, His good, name's very ralph. good looking though but he's lovely yeah, yeah. he's lovely but he was actually almost in the fetal position <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was like and it was yes no and he obviously oh. hated being interviewed so i just turned it around and i said you hate this don't you and he said, yeah. Why do you hate it? Well, it's not, it's not, you know, it's yes. okay. And he's like, I just don't like, I don't like, I like to, you know. And then we had this brilliant conversation about how he likes to hide behind a part. Yes. And he's not that comfortable. And that was fascinating. So I think if you just go with it and, and, and be normal, you know, don't, because I always think, have a conversation, you yes. know, rather than an interview. Because I always yes. say to people, look, this is just a wee chat. Don't worry about anything. Look at me, ignore Everything Nobody else, asked. we're just having we're just having mm-hmm. a wee chat, and and it is about doing your homework, and it is always trying to make them comfortable, even if it's somebody that's coming in to be held to account, they should still feel comfortable, and I do think that a lot of politicians, um, they sort of put their guard down with me, yes, because they think, oh well. But do they this under- is fine. But, but, this is but, but just going to be nice. Is that because they're underestimating yes, you? Yes, yes, which is great. And but does that not make you really cross? <laughs> no, it doesn't. I love it. I do. I do. I'm so you don't you don't want to pin them to the floor and then hound them with questions about that? Yeah, point, I just think it? it's I just think it's wonderful, and I think you get so much more. I know that there is, a, a, you know, some news organisations in particular like this sort of gladiatorial, confrontational style. Yes. And um, that tends to be more about them than anything. Yes. I just think let them talk because yes. oh, it's brilliant. Because then that's when you, they can say something, and you can just you can just go in and say, oh. Oh, you yeah. said that? Well, that's what you mean. And then go, oh, nyang, 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 because they've forgotten all the training that they've had because yeah. they're relaxed and that's yes. very good. And have you had any absolute shockers that you look back and think, oh, my God, that was horrendous? The worst interview I ever did was, uh, without doubt, was with uh, Buzz Aldrin, the second man in the moon, oh. because I am a geek and he was fantastic. And I just sat going, I don't know what happened to me. I just, I, I don't know, because I was so excited. Yes. And he was so lovely. I mean, I got over it eventually. But the first, I would say the first couple of minutes of that interview were not, not good. Great. Not they were not good. That most people, I'll be totally honest with you, most people that come on are really good because they are on to, by and large, talk about something yes, or indeed themselves. I mean, yes. if you've got an actor or a musician or whatever coming on, that's great. So they're coming on to do that. What I get very cross about is if they've been really nice to me and then I find out they've not been nice to mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. lassie that makes it, Lorraine or Nemes, who makes them up or yeah. Helen who does makeup or any of my team. Yes. I get very cross about that because yeah. that's not on. You don't do that. So they're on the naughty list. Yeah. You don't invite them back. Good. <laughs> so let's roll back a little bit to, to East Kilbride and um, so the East Kilbride news and then you took the step which you know quite a lot of journalists do which is to go from print into broadcast. Yeah. Now what was your thinking behind that? Do you know, I think I, I just wanted to try something new. I felt as if I'd done what I could with the local newspaper. I loved it. I mean, yeah. I'd been very happy to stay there. But I thought, no, I'm going to try and get a job with the BBC. Yes. So I have a drawer full of rejection letters. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, you couldn't, you wouldn't imagine. I'd apply for everything. Alison, I applied to BBC Aberdeen to be their farming correspondent. Well, I have lost. no right, idea lost. of one end of a cow from another. I don't know anything about anything. But I just thought I'll apply for everything. Eventually they'll get so fed up with me that they'll have to give me a job. And so it came to pass because they did. But, the, the, but there must be lots of people here who've been through that experience. Oh, it's horrible. And 
But it, can be times you just think, oh, oh I'll know, just stay where I am or I'll but just... I just... Well, the thing was, I suppose I just thought eventually it will happen. I mean, I had this thing saying eventually it's going to happen. And I did get a job with the BBC Scotland as a researcher. Um, mm -hmm. It was a programme that they launched, none of you remember it, called 60 Minutes, which was a sort of, it was the local news and the main, you know, the... Right, yes. The, the big news. Yeah, the yeah, big yeah. news mm -hmm. <laughs> all together. Um, and it was fascinating and I loved it. And I was a researcher and I had to work as a waitress at night um, because the money was so terrible. I mean, yeah. my salary halved Gosh, um, yeah. almost overnight, but it was worth it because the, the experience was amazing. But I knew that I wouldn't get anywhere with the BBC when I used to, they used to always send me out to do Vox Pops, you know, back yeah, in those yeah, days. Vox Pop, yeah. You used to always say, oh, everybody will talk to you. And I would go away and talk to nuns and yeah. like policemen and horseback. I'd find people that were quirky, you know, I would yes. always find somebody because they'd always have something to say. You know, that woman with, with the crazy hat on, which is amazing, she'll be great. Because look at her, she's, she's going yeah. to be, so I was always trying to find, find them out. And then I thought, I get uh, hauled into the big boss's office and I thought, I'm going to get a job as a reporter, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to be out there yeah. and, uh, getting stories. And, he, and, he, and I always remember, he sort of put his glasses down and just looked up at me and he said, you're never going to make it in television. Never. He said, never, not, not with that accent. Oh, he said, no. he said He said my Glasgow accent was offensive. And I had to oh, go and take... No. Um, and this was in Scotland, though? Aha! Uh -huh, this oh. is BBC Scotland. <laughs> this is BBC Scotland. And That's... I, I kind of thought, oh, OK. But back then, this was 1983, 84. Yeah. You didn't have Anton Deck. No. Speaking of with, with no, beautiful yeah. Geordie accents. You didn't have people like Eamon, you know, coming yes. from Northern Ireland. Yes. Or, or, or myself coming... You, you, even, in, even in BBC Scotland, people were sort of Edinburgh posh, what I would call yes. it, you know, that sort yes. of lovely accent, beautiful yes. accent, um, just with a wee hint of Scottish, but that, that was all. But you didn't get somebody talking like me or not even so much talking like me, but using the, all the words. Mm -hmm, the language. <laughs> so the did did words. you ever soften your accent or soften yourself? I think, in, I think or, inevitably you do course, when you live yeah. down here. You kind yes. of have to, um, but not, not really. And I sort of thought, but actually, he did the biggest favour because what he did was... It's one of these things, isn't it weird how doors open and all of that? That day, uh, Torquil Riach, there's a name. Right, Torquil yeah. was uh, the correspondent for TVAM in Scotland. And mm -hmm. I always thought TVAM was terribly glamorous. Yeah. You know, it looked sort of, ooh. And everybody just kind of went, ooh, you know, breakfast television. Because it was new and it was exciting. Yeah. And it was interesting and fascinating. And it was sort of like a blank slate yeah. where you could do anything. And Obviously, there was no 24-hour uh, news then. No. So in the morning, that you were really breaking stories. Every, you know, in the morning, that was what I thought was brilliant. So he was leaving and he said to me, I'm leaving, you should just apply for it. And I said, but I don't have any experience and I've just been told. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody will understand me. And of course, TVM being, you know, it was network. So yes. it's a big, big deal. Um, and I applied. I just applied and I got taken down. It used to be where MTV was, you know, down at Camden Lock. It's oh, still yeah, got yeah. the little egg mm -hmm. cups. Um, and I applied for the job and, and I got it because the boss was Australian. Mm -hmm. and, didn't and understand your accent. He, he yeah. just thought we all, you know, all of us <laughs> sound the same, really. He didn't really understand. But he wanted somebody Scottish to do the job and that was the biggest learning curve I've ever ever had in my life. I mean, I think the first the first day that I was there, there was a shooting in, and we would never have shootings in, in, in Scotland, obviously, apart from the hellish yeah. um, Dumbleen, but that somebody had been shot at Glenrothes Airport and, and I had just had to go out and, and do that for the next morning. And uh, wow, it was just, but yeah, did, you, did you ever get get running. into situations like that where you just thought, I just don't know what I'm doing here. I'm out of my depth. I was lucky. I had an amazing journalist um, working with me. Ian, Ian was there for the first couple of months and then I was on my own. And Ian was the kind of guy who, he might go down to the pub, but he would write the most beautiful script. It'd be in the back of a fag packet. Yes. But he would write the most beautiful script. And he, he taught me a lot. He taught me an about, awful, about awful lot. About how to write script and... About how to do that, about how, just about how to you know, fake it till you make it sort yeah. of thing. You know, because yeah, obviously I'm standing there, you know, and my stomach is going round and round. Yes. I'm blinking, you know, washing machine. And I'm thinking, oh, this is terrible. But you just have to, you know, he was very good at like focusing, yeah. compartmentalise, just get the piece of camera done and then think about this and think about that. He was really, really good at that. But I just learned on the job. Yes. And there wasn't really any official training as such. You just kind of kept on did going. It. And we were, again, this was, we, we didn't even have a mobile phone. We had a telex. Yeah. You know, like they used to, you won't remember because you're all too young. They, 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 I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. We, didn't have, we didn't have a computer. 
Yes. And then we did get a computer. It was those ones that went yeah. like that, and it took. <laughs> remember then? Oh, it was it was just crazy. It so was would crazy. you say that you're ambitious? It's a really difficult word to use, ambitious, because it's it got a negative connotation, it has, right? It, and it shouldn't have. But um, driven, probably. I think yes. driven. I think, and that's definitely from my parents. Yes. Definitely from them, even though they weren't, you know, they're not the most, um, they never pushed us, my brother and I, but they showed us the world and what was possible. Mm -hmm. That was the really good thing. So what, you were, what were you driven by or what the were story? you driven towards? I think the story. I just want to tell the story. You yes. know, that, I think it was that. And the thing about TVM and being the Scottish correspondent for TVM was, it, you know, getting a call at two in the morning, you know it's not going to be, yay! jazz yeah. hands it, you really it, that, and that's difficult but it was really important and like I was saying we didn't have 24 hour news so yes. you were getting the story out there and because we were such a tight team there was only me and a cameraman and a sound man Mm -hmm. That was it. Mm -hmm. That, so that it was, was it. We were, and, and I was actually sleeping with the cameraman. <laughs> I, it's fine. We got married. We've been married for thirty years. It's fine. What about the sound man? <laughs> what happened to him? No, he was oh. not. He wasn't. Oh, he wasn't insane. there. Oh, well. But you know, things like when Lockerbie happened, I literally I know, nudged. I, was ask you, I nudged I'm quite Steve interesting about that. We so, went. so tell us about Lockerbie. I mean, that must have been one of the most difficult oh, it was things. You... It was horrible. It come off a really weird summer. We had all the prison riots, which were. Yes. really awful mm -hmm. and that was that, that they were hellish they really were um, and then we had Piper Alpha you know the yes, oil rig disaster and 166 men died and you know that was awful that was I don't know how any of them got out of that actually it was uh, that was something and then I thought to myself right okay that's going to happen now you know we'll just go back to doing the usual yes, yes. football and all yes. because it was only me that was a great thing it was only me so I, um, if there's a sports story I did it and that was the other thing about underestimating you. There was no women uh, sports yes. reporters there. Very few, very mm -hmm. few in the UK. I don't think there was certainly not any, um, you know, that were on camera. And uh, they used to just think you were a daft wee lassie. It was brilliant. Mm. <laughs> but, but brilliant, was brilliant. yes, because you can prove them wrong. But also, did you annoying. not get a very annoying as well? Oh, absolutely, yes. of course. Yeah. You, know, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, misogynist yeah. twats and all that sort of thing. <laughs> the words to that effect. But, but yeah, um, so I thought, well, OK, We'll go back to, and then of course Lockerbie happened and that was horrific. It's really weird, Alison, because of all the horrible things, and it was dreadful, and the only way I got through that was thinking that it was like a, a movie. Yes. It was like a movie scene, it wasn't yes. real. You know, these bodies weren't real. Um, but the thing that, that, that really made me, broke me really, was uh, people in the village taking their Christmas decorations down. And I know oh, that sounds mad. No, no. But that, that really struck me because it was like, oh, crikey, this, you know, the, for them, you know, this has absolutely had the, the worst... I don't think people talked enough about the effect it had on the village. Those around. Um, you know, obviously 11 people died um, yes. when bits of the aeroplane yes. like, crashed into the houses. I mean, you imagine you're sitting watching the telly. Uh, horrendous. You don't, you don't think but isn't it. so much a good reporting about the detail? That detail about taking the decorations down yeah. is yeah, something just that people can that? identify mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And, and I think that's interesting. Do you feel in your reporting you're able to bring those details? Where sometimes... This is a terrible sweeping statement, but a lot of men, it, it, it's a big, big, big picture reporting yeah, rather than that. and it's that. about them, oftentimes. Yes. Not so much now, I don't mm -hmm. think, but certainly I did witness then. that. I witnessed that myself when I was looking. And I think, but that again was the, if you like, the privilege of working for um, breakfast television, you know, yes. uh, because you're allowed to be not mawkish in any way whatsoever. You know, that's one of my pet hates, but there is, you know, there's a line, but you can be emotional um, and you can get those emotions across, but you must never cross the line into making it about you or making, yes. it, or making it mawkish or, or uncomfortable, yes. but you can actually talk about it. And that, that was very unusual back then. This is 80, 80 89. Mm -hmm. So that was quite, quite unusual. And again, you know, I, I, it, it, it was such an, an amazing thing to do. At the same time, you're very aware that it's a massive disaster and people are really suffering. Mm. So you have to get that across. Mm. You know, this is horrendous what's happened here to these people, to all of them. It's just awful, you know, and, and that's important to get that across as well as getting everything else across. Mm. But that's why that, that, that particular show that we did, you were able to do that. You know, you could be, you could just talk. Yes. You know, I wasn't, yes. in a sense, of course I was doing packages and I was yes. doing reports, but I was also doing lives where I was just talking. Yes. You know, like a, like talking like a conversation rather than a um, standing here, yes. you know, that kind yes. of thing. So it's much more that's, human. You know, that's, that's appropriate when it's appropriate, mm. but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes mm. the story is so like Dublin mm -hmm. or we've just seen the death of the Queen. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's okay. 
yeah. in order to do that. And there's, a, there's a lot to talk now about um, the impact on journalism, about sort of going, reporting on trauma and on mental health um, of the journalists themselves, yeah. something that was never even considered no. back no. in the 80s no. and 90s. No, it wasn't. I mean, have you ever been through experiences such as Lockerbie or, or then Dunblane where it's really troubled you personally? Oh, absolutely, 100%. And you're right. I, I mean... I, the way that I kind of handled it was my poor dad. And my dad doesn't, you know, most dads, he doesn't say much. No. All he wants, when he says, you use that thing when I phone, and you go, I'll just get yeah, your mum. <laughs> and he goes, yes, uh -huh, yes, uh -huh. yes. He's like that. But he came down to get me because obviously Lockerbie was over Christmas. And yes. I, I did get a couple of hours off to go up to have Christmas with them. And yeah. he was going to bring me back. And I just talked at him the whole time. My dad, you won't want to talk about this, you know, while he's driving. <laughs> and I just went, like that. And it all came out. And that made me, that made me feel a lot. A lot better, actually. Yes. I think that helped. But I think now looking back, it took me a long time to get to get over that. And I think, but back then, you know, you just you just kind of got on with it. You know, mm. even after Dunblane, you, you sort of got on with it. You didn't really you didn't really think about it. And it is important to deal with that. And it's not a sense. You know, there's no way is it you being weak, saying, Do you know what, I'm drowning a bit here because you're a human being. Yes. And of course you are. Of course you are. That's horrendous. So then you came down to London mm -hmm. and then you, you sort of became the star of Breakfast Television and you and you were TVM and then you went to Good Morning Britain in its sort of first yeah, outing in, in that, yeah. yes. So, so, so you did all that and then, but at the same time as you were doing all that, you were starting a family. Yes, I, so, got, I got pregnant and I was enormous, absolutely enormous. And I was doing six right the way through, which was a bit, I worked until two weeks before she was born. Not into, I, I thought, I always thought I was going to have two weeks of running about daft and then I was two weeks, I had all my Bette Davis films, oh Joan yeah, Crawford great. films, mm -hmm. barrels of chocolate and I was just going to sit there and like that and do that. And I never got that and I still feel cheated. <laughs> After all those years. Just take two weeks off and cheated. do it. I know. And I, and I was, you know, it, it was all fine. My, my daughter was great. It was fine. And then just when I thought I was coming back, I was supposed to, I had her in the June. Um, June the 8th and then I was coming back to work in September September mm -hmm. the 1st because you didn't get you know no, we're freelance so you don't less than get two much months. time yeah. yeah and I was coming back and I just got a call to say um, well thanks very much uh, this was the boss thanks very much uh, we don't need you though uh, so don't bother coming in <laughs> because we've got someone else and you go oh god okay and you're kind of thinking I've just had this wee baby. You know, you're all, you know, I don't, everybody yeah. will know what it's like when you've had a child if you have had one. You're not feeling your best. No. You know, you're not. You really know. And, you know, you're just not. Uh, mentally or physically, you're just not. Yeah. You're, you're all over the place. And that was because it was a boat from the blue. I had absolutely no idea. And what legally, was going to were they allowed to do that? Yeah, because I'm freelance. I'm freelance. Gosh. So Even and, though you'd been on every day and there was a regular slot there and no it was and the only reason that I still that I'm still doing this today I think was I mean I'll tell you but when that happened I thought what am I going to do because we just moved down south Steve had Steve was a cameraman yes. and he'd stopped all his freelance stuff up in uh, up in Scotland and he'd come down to London and be starting all over again so it was quite difficult and I just put baby under one arm and in those days it was a VHS tape yeah. of my best bits you know yeah. and I went round everywhere I just went round and said if you've got anything and I went to Scotland and they with great glee told me that there was nothing unless I could speak Gaelic so, so were you doing but were you doing it at, <laughs> that, at that point because you were desperate to get back into the workplace or you needed the money both. or you were just it pissed was, off it, and it you was, wanted your it was both and I wasn't really pissed off Alison I was absolutely distraught you know, it was like, because I loved my job and I, and, I, and I loved it. And I was just like, oh, and I hadn't done anything wrong. I'd just gone and had a baby. And, you know, they just wanted a change. And look, that's fine. Bosses want a change. That's absolutely fine. But they wouldn't be able to do that now. Employment law wouldn't allow them to do that. I don't think they would. I don't think they would. And I don't think, I don't think they would be allowed, but I don't think they would either. Times have changed no, exactly. dramatically. They do it. dramatically. Yes. And of course, the great irony is I'm a million times better at my job when I had my baby. Yes. A million times better. You know, the empathy, you know, the, the yes. maturity. Um, yeah, it, it, you're just better. But that you know? could have been, you know, when you look back on oh, your geez. career, there must have been a few points where you think that's that's the crossroads. You could have just said, oh, this is too much. This is yeah. too much like hard work. I probably was thinking along those lines. And then I got a call saying that, um, from the same boss, <laughs> to yeah. say, uh, we've, got, we, we've got a slot that we want to do a mother and baby slot. They wanted to do it because they got sponsorship. So patronising though, isn't I it? Know. How we talk about babies? <laughs> and cock the babies so it was only on a Tuesday and a Thursday from 9 o'clock until 25 past now of course the feist to me wants to say shove it yeah, you know exactly. you do that's your yeah. first reaction is I but your second reaction is uh, I've got a baby here and yeah. we need to do so I thought 
they had nothing to lose. It did really well and they offered me my own show in the January. So she was born in the June, I was sacked in September, went back on in the November, October, November to do the thing and then got my own show in the, in the January. Not because they thought, oh, isn't she fabulous? It was because people watched. Yes. The ratings were good. Yes. Oh, <laughs> no, a round of applause for that. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> but then, and now looking back, I mean, have there been other incidents where you feel you were treated badly or more harshly because you're a woman? Or? I don't think so. I think, though, I am not the norm. I'm not, because, I mean, when I was a correspondent, it was just me, like I was saying. Mm -hmm. So I would be doing the biggest story of the day, all the sport, the skateboarding duck, the whole lot. Yeah. You know, absolutely everything. So I, and also through my career, I've always had fantastic women mentors. Yes. I mean, if you look at it today, my fantastic editor, Victoria, is a girl. Yes. You know, uh, Emma, who's our boss, is yes. a girl, and the head yes. of ITV is a woman as well. Um, and that makes all the difference in the but world. But that must have changed enormously, oh, the structure huge. from when you first got there. Oh, uh, it's, it's chalk and cheese. It really and is. And how has that changed then the culture, do you think, of television? Immeasurably, as far as we're concerned. I think there's a lot, even practical things like job sharing. Yes. You know, job sharing, because, you know, when someone goes, in, and I know this, obviously, I'm very invested in this from, from personal experience. If one of our girls, um, I was called my girls, my girls yeah, and my yeah, boys, yeah, my babies, yeah. but if one of them uh, goes away and has a baby, I know she's going to come back better. Yes. I know she's going to come back exhausted. <laughs> but I know she's going to come back better than she was. Um, and now it's great because it's not like when I was there and you take two months off or a month. Mm -hmm. You get time, you get mm -hmm. time. But you're going to come back better. Why would you want to lose someone like that? Why would you want to? It doesn't make any sense at all. Never even mind the kindness aspect or the, the humanity, if you mm -hmm. like. From a, from a purely practical point yes. of view, you've got a brilliant resource for yes. your company. Why would you know? It makes no sense. So you get two people and they work together and they work it out. And you get the best from two people rather than the worst. Because you know what it's like if you're working full time and you've just had a baby. It's hard. It is. A yeah. lot of women do it and a lot of women have mm -hmm. to do it. But they shouldn't have to. Mm. You know, they shouldn't. And, and it's you just get so much more from your, from your mm. employers. You just but you need to get employees. to that point where you have enough women in senior positions that, that it becomes a tipping point and it becomes a, and that's a cultural change. That's yeah. absolutely what's happened. But I know how lucky we are. And that yes. doesn't happen everywhere. I'd like to think that it did. And yeah. I hope that it does. But it's important. And it's important to just, it's nudging, isn't yes. it? It's yes, nudging, it is. nudging, nudging, nudging. You know, yeah. just keep doing that. And I know you've already also spoken in the past about having had a miscarriage yeah. as well. And then, and how did you work, or did you work through that? And how was that? I went back to work far too quickly. It was stupid, um, you know, m mentally and physically, it was daft. I, I, I was kind of, I think I was kind of in denial, and I just thought, I, I only took a few days off, and it was stupid. It mm. was really, really, really stupid, because I wasn't handling it very well. Do you um, think miscarriage in the workplace is still something that's not really recognised as to how to cope with that? I think so. I do, and, I, and again, when that happened... If I'd had um, the editor I've got now, and I had Emma, and I had you know I had that hierarchy, if you like, I would have been able to say to them, which I can now, you know, I'd be able to say to them, actually, I don't, I don't really think I can, you know, I might need a wee bit of help here. Yes. And I would get it. That's yes. the wonderful thing. I would actually get it. But I just, I did. I went back to work too fast. I mean, and and in denial, and it was stupid. It was, it was really stupid. It was and do you silly. ever feel, do you ever feel sort of sad that? Sort of, there were things that happened to your generation, our generation, my generation, yeah. that were that much harder than they are for people now. Or I even do. sort of slightly jealous. That I do. Things no, are I think it's good that we did that so that other people don't have to. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I, I mean that if you have that experience, I don't want any of my team to have that same sort of experience. You know, I want them, and that that's so important to us that you know if anybody is struggling a bit, that we give them a bit of slack and we, yes. we help them. You know, if somebody's yes. got health problems mentally or physically, that they know they can go, hey, I'm struggling a wee bit here, and nobody's going to go, mm, I'll put a wee black mark there, you're not going to get yes. promoted. Because that's stupid, isn't yes. it? It's just daft. You know, so yeah, I, I, yeah, I think sometimes as well you've got you've got to do it and go through it so that the people behind you don't have to. Absolutely, and which, is, really it, which is an amazing sort of sense of sisterliness and sisterhood. But it's important. Which, but I think sometimes traditionally in, in journalism and, and in all sorts of um, careers, really, some of the women that made it first didn't necessarily mm. help Pull up those the ladder, right? them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hate that. Yeah. I really hate that and I don't understand it. It makes no sense to me. Mm. And I really don't understand why if you get to a certain stage in, in your career, why would you want to keep all that to yourself? Do you mm. know, I, mean, I was lucky enough to have amazing women that, that helped me, and men, absolutely, that helped me. And I just think you've got to, you know, you do, it's like pay it forward. I know it's a 
sort of but cliche, it's, but it's yeah. it's true. It's yes. really true. I do, what is the point of having all of that yes. if you can't share it? And another um, area that is discussed more um, nowadays is menopause in the workplace <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. And I know on your programme you talk about this a lot. And I mean, do you think that that's getting better in oh, terms absolutely. of in journalism? But you know, it's really interesting. We talked about it. It must be about five or six years ago. I couldn't get anybody to come on and talk about it. No. Couldn't we, not? we couldn't. We couldn't get anyone. Yeah, Nobody guess. would because we we talked to women in the public eye and they go, mm, yeah. "I'm going through it." But and their thing was they didn't want to be perceived as being old. No. Exactly. Which is nuts, right? I yeah. mean, it is absolutely nuts. So what we did was I just swapped seats and Dr. Hillary interviewed me. So I became but the interviewer. that's interview. quite brave because then you are saying to the general public, the viewers, your bosses, everybody else. But everybody goes through it. Everybody, mm. you know, every woman. And sadly, some women go through it earlier than others. So what? what's the big deal? It's just another process. It's another time in your life. And I'm so glad that we've taken the sting out of it. I mean, obviously, you know, there's lots more programmes about it, lots more people have talked. Thank goodness. But in, in show business and in journalism, isn't part of the anxiety that people are worried that it's going to be the end of their career if they suddenly flag up the point that they're I over 50? I think it depends how, that's a really, really good question. But I honestly think, Alison, it depends on why you were hired in the first place. Mm. You know, like when I was hired, um, or I was asked after Lockerbie to come down and fill in yes. uh, the six to seven slot, and I hope to God nobody's got my first day on <laughs> Oh, Jesus. I was so nervous. It, the show was six to seven. At half six, I'd run through all the... I wasn't listening to timings or anything. I just kept going... Like that. And that's the end of the show. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it fell for half an hour. <laughs> I was dragging things in. Oh, it, was, it was absolutely mad. It, it really was. But... Yeah, it, oh, I hope nobody ever 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 sees that because it's just um, yeah, it was crazy. What was I talking about? So no, you were talking about so whether you be, ever become anxious that people oh, might start yes. to think, no, oh, no, no, no. you know, so time I was for hired, younger. Yeah, I was hired then, and I remember the boss at the time saying, um, I think his words were, "You don't make my trousers twitch," and um, uh, yeah, nice. Oh, my lord! Uh, I know. But I, I was like. Good. Great. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You, you know, don't make my mind twitch either. Yeah, yeah, I know. That was terrible. Um, but Gosh. at the same time, I wasn't hired for that. You know, I think if you're a, a presenter yes. or yes. an actress or act, actor or, or a presenter and you're kind of being hired, not just because you look what you look like, but if that's been a big part of it, then of course you're going to feel insecure. Of course you are. If that's part of why you are. But for me, it was never that. You know, that was never, yes. I was nev never in a million years was it anything to do with that. So that was good. So I didn't have that pressure. And I, I don't understand why people lie about their age anyway, because everybody you went to school with knows. Yes, they do. They, they all do. know. And they're like, ah, that, that will yeah. be right. I'm not sure what yeah. she's talking about. That much rather people think, oh, she looks not bad for 62 rather than... Crikey, you know, yeah. she's kidding on she's 50, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite... And, and whilst your job is very much around showbiz, journalism has still remained a really yeah. key part. And, and not only do you do real journalism on your show, you've also continued writing a newspaper column up until relatively recently. And, and also, I, I always think on Twitter, you're very outspoken aren't you you're quite yeah, out there aren't you you're like not them. frightened to have opinions on all sorts no, of things no and i get and i get quite picky i mean just today somebody somebody put um you're an airhead but you're oh, what oh, oh you are me. and i mean it's That's, you are you know with the yes. apostrophe come on you know i wasn't bothered about being called an airhead i've been called a lot worse but i just thought get the grammar right yeah, I know. <laughs> if you're going to insult somebody make sure that it's done <laughs> properly <laughs> Exactly, I know. But I, no, I do like that. And, and actually, on the show, I can be quite yes. cheeky. I'm allowed oh, yes. to be cheeky, and I don't do it very often. But you know but I mean, is. that is another area I think that sometimes for women can be quite difficult because a sometimes women grow up feeling they shouldn't be too abrasive with their views, and b I think we're now in the situation with social media where women are getting shut down for yeah, and, uh, too many views. That is outrageous. How, how do you navigate that? But I think you navigate it by treating social media with the contempt it deserves. Um, I do think it's a fantastic resource. I think it's absolutely amazing. I really do. Yeah. Um, wonderful things have happened. You know, regimes have fallen. Yes, they have, um, yeah. and, and amazing things have happened. But really, you have to take a kilo of salt. And you have to realise that it is ants with megaphones. You know, mm. it, this is not the real world. It's a very, very small, strange wee world. And usually somebody who is having a go at you... Um, I just mute them. I don't even block them because if you block somebody, they know. Yes. So I just mute them and then they're just, it's like somebody's ranting in a room where there's nobody there and they're but just stopping themselves. it doesn't themselves. get you down ever? Not really. Not really. I, I think you can't let it get to you. You, yeah. you just, you, you, you can't. Of course. Of course you'd always, you know, 99 people can say, you're fabulous. And then yeah, one yeah. person says, you're, yeah. you're an Egypt. And then you're going to remember the person that says yes. that. But that's human nature. That's inevitable. But I honestly do think, and I, I would say this especially to younger 
particularly younger women, please don't let it get don't let it get to you. If it is getting to you, shut it down. Because actually yeah. walk away, just walk away um, or go on Instagram. Although Instagram's getting a bit snarky. It it's is. not as snarky as but Twitter. But isn't that just bonkers? A concern, though, that people need to have that presence for their career? Um, I don't think so. I don't think you need to. Not so much. I think probably a few years ago with Twitter. But I think yeah. Twitter's getting very discredited now. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, it seems to be a lot of old ranty men. Yes. Ranting. Very, very angry. Uh, very angry. Very angry at all sorts Why of are they so angry? I don't understand. I don't know. Small pieces. I don't know. It's got to be something like that. I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know. know why they get so cross. No. You want to say to me, are you all right? Yeah. I know. Are you okay? <laughs> are you all right? The other thing, and we're going to get to questions soon. I know there's going to be lots of questions. But the other thing I just wanted to talk about sort of the industry more broadly as well, both in television sure. and in um, news generally, is that it's about finding new ways to appeal to younger audiences. Yes. But how do you see, how do you see a show like yours continuing into the future and, and how, how do we still engage with people? It's so interesting. When it was the um, the COVID, as my mother calls it, the COVID, <laughs> when it was the COVID, um, we got such an amazing influx. Of course we did because everybody's at home. Yeah. And we got loads and loads of young people watching us, 16 to 25, and we have managed to hold on to them. It's, you know, Not all of them, because a lot of them are back at uni or yeah, yeah. doing whatever they're doing or, or working, hopefully. Um, but we, we did hold on to a lot of them and I think that's to do with I don't know whether it's because I've been around for a long time, but like people at KSI want yes. to come on. That's you brilliant. You know, we Louis Capaldi last week wants to come on and he was very naughty. Because he gave me a he gave me a record and he said, Do you want my seven inches? You know. <laughs> and if you know, you know. And I said, yeah, yeah. Thanks. You know. But it's they can be cheeky. I'm like their auntie, I'm like their naughty auntie. Yes. That maybe wants to go out with them for a sherry or two. Yes. So that they quite like coming on. Also, what I think is really important is um, keeping an open mind all the time and our gang you know my lovely uh, my lovely team as you know uh, are, are young yes. you know they're, they're young and they keep me young they really do they keep me young as well so I always want to know what they're thinking yes. what are they thinking what are they wearing what are they doing what are they seeing what are they watching what's interesting to them how are they getting their news you know all of this it's, I find it fascinating it, also having a daughter as well helps too brings you back to that point about being curious and mm. that is probably the secret to your longevity isn't it you've remained yeah. curious you've got to though you've got to I mean, me and Michael Palin on this weekend it was him when I went to a lecture that he gave and he said that and he's he's 80 he's yes. not 80 he's 18 yes I mean his outlook on life is incredible and he's you know he's still he wants to know everything mm. he wants to know everything and he doesn't you know he says I'm 80 I'm still going to travel I'm still mm. going to do stuff and, and I hope I'll be like him fabulous and if you had just like in one sentence the perfect advice to people about their careers and how to how to still enjoy their careers in yeah. general because if you enjoy it you'll stick with it what would that be I think it's kind of like be be true to yourself. You know, honestly, I know that sounds a terrible cliche, but but stick to your guns. Stick to your guns. Have we've all got gut feelings. And we all we all mm -hmm. we all trust your gut. Trust that. That's really important. Don't be put off your path that you're going on. Don't just go with the crowd. You yes. know, when everybody's having a pop at something or everybody's doing something, you just stick to what you want to do and do your blinking homework. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Right. So now over to questions. So. Oh, where should we begin? Yes. Would you like I to start? Uh, yeah, I've got many, but I'll only ask two. Um, <laughs> um, so, I have two questions, um, and then I've had journalism questions from your from your own experience. One of them is, and this is something that happens to me a lot, but not just me, but you know, if you've got a, a specific kind of area that, you know, for example, I'm a Muslim and I'm Pakistani, so very stories come up about Pakistan and Muslims. It's like, let's go to M, which is fine and great. Um, so I can speak, oh, you can hear me now, <laughs> which is fine and great because I get that recognition at that time. But as soon as the, the big story is gone, um, it's like, okay, back to normal. No, I don't, how would you then use that to your advantage in the future? Because then it's like, right, go, go back and do the, you know, the other stories and that's it. You know, it doesn't help. I, don't, I can't see, and, I, and other colleagues like myself can't see how that helps our career. They, you're pigeonholed when you need to be pigeonholed, but then when you want to move on, it doesn't seem to have that long lasting effect. And I don't know if that happened to you. If there's like a story about Scotland, do they always come to you <laughs> kind of thing? I don't I don't yeah. know, but it's it's quite an, quite interesting. It doesn't happen with me, it happens with many other people. Yeah. But it's like, well, how can we use that to our advantage? Because as soon as that big story is gone, then you're back to, back to your desk and everybody forgets what amazing stuff you've just done. And the other question is, um, moving on for that is, how do you, how can you, um, how can you control uh, not being big footed 
in the industry. So say you score a massive interview and say, thank you very much. You're not doing this, of course, and pass it on. And then mm. obviously that happened. And then, then they say, you might be able to work on it and we'll see you might be able to get some kind of credit, but that's it. And then obviously nobody ever knows who the producer is and nobody ever knows who actually did the work behind the scenes. Like, how do you even like, how but, do you but, uh, The viewers might situation? not know, but the people that you work with surely know. And if you, I mean, that was when, when I was, um, when I was working as a correspondent, uh, I was, every, every morning you had to be a saleswoman. Uh, you, you really did, and you had to sell the stories to the desk. You know, and I would always like bombard them constantly, always, always, always. I think it's plugging away. I think that's really, that, what you're saying there is actually really worrying that because you happen to be a Muslim, because you happen to be Pakistani, that that's the stories you do. I mean, in one way, of course, it makes perfect sense because you're going to bring a depth of knowledge to that that I couldn't. Um, I should be able to though, but I, so I mean I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily. But that should be all that you're doing. Yeah, but it's like. Do you feel as if you're pigeonholed into that? And I then feel like I don't mind doing because I'm thinking, oh, it's my time now to shine. That's yeah. fine, and I'm happy to do it. I like doing it because I give them knowledge that they might not know. Of but course. Then it's like it doesn't help me progress in my career. Then it's like okay, back to the normal stories. Thanks for that, Em. Do you know it's one mm. of it's it doesn't you it just you know it doesn't seem to not even and it's not just a, a, a thing with me. I see it everywhere. Do you think that's a thing specifically for women, though, or is that does, does that happen to male colleagues as well? Because it's fascinating. I'm not sure, actually. I've never spoken to my male colleagues about it. We only you should. Like, really only speak to my female journalism colleagues about this. But yeah, we just we do we do see it. Uh, we do see this happening, and we'd like. I wonder how we could just use this. Look, we've done this, this an amazing thing. You know, like when the Pakistan floods happened. Like when the Pakistan floods happened. So I literally was the lead, and I got them all the amazing guests and did everything. And then, you know, I could have gone on set, but they chose someone who has no relation to the country or knowledge to go on set. You know, it's like loads of. It's just like, how do you make that work to your advantage? It's not a matter of the I don't mind doing it, but how do you, how do you how do you work that? I wonder if in that point would is that the point that you would have had a conversation with your boss. I mean, it ha I mean, that's always quite tricky, isn't it? Say, oh, can I have a word? Yeah, no, you but have to. Do you have to at that point? I think you do, I think you do. See, this is where I was so lucky that because I had to do everything that I never had, I was never kind of pigeonholed like that. But so interesting what you said about Scotland, because you're absolutely right, that's, that, that's what happens. But that's okay, I mean, that's all right. Because I would, if you were in, if you were in my team, and you know, the, the flood town, we would, of course we would come to you because you, you would know, but we would put you on air. You know, we would, because why wouldn't we? And maybe really it's about it. finding that confidence somehow to be able to have that conversation. Yeah. That's a hard one. And I know it's, yeah, it's not easy no, at all. No, it's not easy. It really it's not easy isn't. when you work for the, a massive organisation. Mm. It's like a triangle, isn't it? Mm. Oh, we've got a question. Oh, oh there, Kate. Hi, yeah. Hiya. Lorraine. <laughs> Kate Mancy. Um, I love the montage of all your best bits, but one of my favourite bits of Lorraine was when you said to Jennifer Arcuri, <laughs> what, what was the point of that? Which what was, an idiot. Like, but what was, the, what was the kind of lead up to that? Did you let the bosses know, look, no. I'm going to say something? Or did it just no, come no, out? No, you tell us, <laughs> no, you tell gosh, us no. It was just um, so funny. I'm, I'm kind of uh, unleashed. I think it's just, and Piers Morgan's hilarious, as you well know. Um, I don't know. I think we had this, um, you know, we do this trail if you yeah. ever see the show um, and I'd have to see what's coming up and I was just watching it and I was watching it with all the crew you know because we're in a separate studio and I was getting more and more annoyed at this idiot woman sitting there burbling away all <laughs> like this and I'm thinking and I was looking at her thinking first of all you've slept with Boris Johnson yikes <laughs> anyway <laughs> but that was something else altogether and then I just thought she's not you know she's sitting there they're obviously Piers and Susanna are brilliant they're ans asking all the right questions and she was just not and I just got so cross with that because I thought it wasn't about, it was just about, mom, and I always think of my mum. My mum's sitting at home, she wants to know what's going on here. How, who do you think you are sitting there not telling her? That's outrageous. And I just got cross, just got angry. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's like... It's very funny. It was, it, well, but I don't think she knew what to do with herself, but I mean, what an idiot. I know. And then if you don't want to talk about it, don't sit don't, there don't go on, on television. the television. Yes, exactly. Saying, hmm, I'm not saying anything. Just, oh, <laughs> these people, honestly. Uh -huh. Anyway. Oh, the lady there. Hello, I'm Trishala. Firstly, I just want to say thank you so much for being such an incredible ambassador, a female ambassador oh, for gosh. young women, because you literally have made such a huge change that you don't even realise. Um, my question is, so I'm actually a dentist, um, my background, and we've just had our first documentary release on BBC, BBC News called Turkey Teeth, which I presented, which I was oh, so happy yes. about. Oh, um, and I'm just like you, like, I resonate so much when you said you literally came out of the room saying why. I'm exactly the same. I have a book of topics that I just want to explore. And 
as I said, I'm a dentist. My background isn't typically journalistic. So what would you say for somebody like me who's really, I've had obviously one really great successful documentary and that's thanks to the team. They're just incredible and they guided me a lot. But obviously now going forward, what is kind of, what's your advice for somebody like me who's really trying to, you know, I to think crack there's, through? There's a lot of kind of, you know, people can get a bit sort of snarky about that. But I think there's lots and lots of different ways to be a journalist. I mean, my, my daughter went to university and got a degree in journalism. I started off in local newspapers. Other people go through different routes. I don't think these days there's like a particular way, the way that we had. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you serve your time in a local newspaper and then you sort of work your way up that way. It's almost like, it's almost like a university in a mm -hmm. sense, university of life. I don't think there is. And I don't think you should be in any way apologetic for the fact you're a dentist. That's brilliant, apart from anything else. Um, and, and I honestly think if you've, you've done something already, that's amazing. You know, so many journalists don't get the opportunity to do that. And I just think you've, you've got something. When you've got something to show a boss, when you've got something to show them and say, look, I did this, this is me, you can fly. If you can, you know, you, you've done it. You've got, and you've got absolutely nothing to prove either. You've done it. You've, you've done an amazing thing. And now all you have to do is build on that. That's all you have to do. And pester, 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 pester. Oh, God, I do pester. Idea. And there's probably no. some people in the room who have received endless emails from me. So I'm just looking down. That's okay. You know, that's okay. I think that's fine. And don't be put off. Because, you know, you obviously you can do it or it wouldn't have been on the telly. Okay. You know, you can do it. So like you said, you imposter syndrome, right? No, I know. <laughs> we're all guilty. We've got to get over ourselves, haven't we? We really do. No, I think you've done brilliantly. You've already made a great start. All you have to do is build on that. Okay. Well, That's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we've got a lady here, like a question. Hello, Lorraine. Hi. Um, you go into people's homes each day. Do people see you as a role model? Um, because I, I'm thinking now of the, the queue gate that's going on with two other people that go into people's homes. So so how do you see yourself and how do you think other people see you? Oh, gosh, do you know what? I'm not very good at analysing myself and I don't really, really think about that. I think if you started thinking about all the people that are watching, then you would it would be weird. It would be, it would be, it would be really strange. I don't consider myself a role model at all. But what I do find when I'm out and about and people will you know, come up and, and talk to you, it's always really funny when, when Steve and I are out, maybe we're, I don't know it, in the pub now and again, you know, obviously not very often. Um, but when we're out, people will come up and talk to me and he'll, he just sits looking baffled. Aww. And then they'll go away and then he'll go, how do we know them? And I go, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. And he's like, thank God. He said, I was sitting there frantically trying to work out who that was. Because people are lovely. I think it's because I've been doing the job for, for such a long time. And, and Dan is here and he'll know exactly the same thing. People are so lovely and they, they consider me to be a friend. What an honour that is. I mean, younger ones, you know, they'll consider me to be the naughty auntie that will get drunk with them. But most people think, especially women, and they tell me things. And it's, what an honour that is. That's a real privilege. And people still send my daughter birthday presents. You know, they still, it's just so lovely. lovely. It, it is it an really honour, but it is also a skill, which an incredible skill which you have and lots of people lovely. don't have. But so. it's really lovely. And people will come up and it takes two minutes to take a quick picture. Two seconds, that's all it takes. And, I, and that's one thing that I get really very angry about that people work and work and work to get to a certain stage and for me the fame whatever it is is a kind of byproduct of what yeah, I do yeah. you know what I mean and I know there's a lot of people that for them that's the be, you know, be all and end all which is very very strange and then they moan yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah they yeah, burn yeah. their butts awesome. off to get yeah. to you know, they're on reality shows and all the yes. rest of it and then they whine yeah. when somebody comes up and says can I get a wee photo mm. No, well, it's not. if you don't like it, go and work with somebody else yeah you know? oh I've got a oh sorry oh, oh yes man because you won't say it but I think the thing you have uniquely is the smile and the the, the pleasantness which, with, with which you do your job. You know, I'm always scowling and I'm always... <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so I don't get very well, but you never do that. Oh. Go to a younger journalist, be like her. <laughs> <laughs> you get more with sugar than vinegar, my granny always used to say. <laughs> she always say that. It is true. Huh. It's absolutely true. Oh, sorry, ladies there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Genevieve. Lovely to meet you. Hello. Huge fan. Of course. Um, my question is that when you moved from kind of a correspondent or maybe a reporter role to then having your own show, show how did the pressure change with your name above the door and do you feel any more, more Gosh, pressure it, with that? It was. I, I can't really think about that too much because it is weird, isn't it? It's quite strange. Um, 
because you are kind of putting your head above the parapet a little bit. But I never had a plan to do that. I mean, all I wanted to do was be was to be what I was doing, to be Scottish correspondent. It was the best job in the world, you know. Obviously, you know, doing the, the, the big stories, but also I've been to just about every single bit of Scotland, you know. And you'd come away from the, the Outer Hebrides with stories falling out your pockets. It was just brilliant. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And I never really planned it. It was just after Lockerbie when I got asked to come down for a week. And I kept saying, I've got to go, I've got to go back. You know, I've got to go. I've got, nearly got to go. I've only bought enough knickers for like five days or <laughs> anything else. I've got to go back, and then it, eventually I, I was there, and it kind of happened. It happened so slowly and so gradually that, and then after obviously when I got sacked and came back to do my own show, the relief was so great that I don't think the reality really hit me, and I still don't think it does to a certain degree. You know, it, it is quite because for me it's the show. It's, called, it's, mm. it's my name, I know it is my name, but it, I still find it quite quite strange that that's what it is. And because when I phone up sometimes, you know, like Chris or everything, they go, hello, Lorraine. And I go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Lorraine, you know. <laughs> so it's like on the phone, when I phone up, to just to see how, they're all, how things are going. And, and it's, it's quite, it is quite strange. It, is, it does come with a little bit of pressure, but for goodness sake, I'm not down a coal mine, you know. <laughs> I mean, oh. really, I'm, I'm not. I'm very, very lucky. And, and again, I couldn't do it without the team I've got. They're brilliant. Absolutely um, brilliant. Janelle, I think... Oh, there's a microphone behind you. Hello, Janelle Aldred. Um, you talked about being surrounded by very charismatic parents and very charismatic teachers. Mm -hmm. And the times are a bit dour at the moment, and I think everyone's feeling a bit low. How can we, as women in the workplace, keep that charisma alive for younger journalists to keep them encouraged and wanting to stay and the second part of that question is what are some of the things you think that women can unintentionally do that pull the ladder up behind them because like I don't think all women do it intentionally maybe no, some do either. but yeah. I think there are some little things that sometimes we forget to do for mm -hmm. women coming behind us and what would you suggest to some of the people in and around what they do you know, could be thinking really about. You know, it's really interesting. I think conversations, just chatting, just saying, how are you? Because, you know, obviously when I was starting, we didn't have the distraction of our phones. And, you know, you know this as well. Sometimes you can walk into an office and they're all like that. You know, they're all on their phones and nobody's talking to one another. And you think we're in the business of communication. That's crazy, isn't it? I think it's that. It's just that. I know that makes it sound really simple, but it's having those conversations and just asking people if they're okay and how are you doing? Because sometimes, I mean, I know from, from my daughter, you know, she works in, in magazines, she also works in, at Times Radio. And, you know, she's, I always say to her, ask, just ask somebody. There's, not, there's never a stupid question. And if they, you know, if they diss you or they're horrible, that says more about them than you, you know, so don't be scared. I always say to people, don't be frightened to actually ask a question because no questions are really daft. And once you know, you know, you're away. You know, mm. you're, you're flying, and, and I do, I, I know what you mean about that, about women, um, maybe not, I think a lot of it is, is, is kind of maybe being a bit scared and a bit fearful and trying to keep a hold of your position. And again, I've been very lucky that I've never had to really deal with that, but I know it goes on, of course it does, you, mm. you must. You must have had that in your career, where you've been, you know, you've been in a situation where just because you happen to be the woman in the room, you know, that's been that's almost counted against you in some ways. And how, you know, it's really interesting. I wonder how you, because you're, you've got a brilliant job and in a great position, how you encourage all, particularly the younger women that are coming in, especially in these days of I think that's really, media. that point you just made about talking to people. I and think it sounds really simplistic I mean, though, doesn't it? But it, but, it but, but it is a way of making people feel included. It's yeah. just, oh, yeah. just to yeah. ask them what they're working on today and then make sure that if it's a conversation that's that they feel included in that conversation. It. And it. it's lots of little things tend to add up to big things, don't they? Yeah. Sometimes people can write big strategies about how we're going to do this, that and the other thing, but it's the little things it's and actually be, doing yeah. them, isn't it? No, absolutely, I agree with you. I think you've got to create because you set the tone as editor you set mm. the tone you know and um, obviously victoria our editor sets the tone but so do i yes you know i've got to and and i want people to feel comfortable so that they can you know so that they can sort of just go i've had this idea now it may be absolutely ridiculous but the more ridiculous the better because it'll spend somebody else will go oh we, well we could do that or we could do this and then all of a sudden you've got a brilliant idea for the next day yeah just because you've given people the opportunity to not feel daft yes. and i think that that is what we can do as women. Absolutely, we can because you, we all, we've all been in a quite a toxic masculine environment where we've been scared to say our piece or we've been nervous about saying our piece, and that's really, really difficult and really hard. So obviously, we need more women in charge, but we we do have to be able to. I, I think work together as a team as well is really important and and help each other. You know, help 
Oh, because the sisterhood's an amazing thing. So powerful, so powerful. We underestimate the power we have, I think. We really do. Um, I've got another question. I think we've got room for time for about two more questions. Yeah, so fine. let's go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Um, my name's Isabel, big fan as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Isabel. My question is, um, especially when you're kind of like starting out in the industry, how do you position yourself to get like the best opportunities? Um, I started a new role recently around three months ago and the kind of common consensus in my workplace is like don't get stuck on the desk and I find that like when the big stories come in obviously they go straight to like the more established kind of like producers correspondents and everyone and obviously I don't expect that because I've been there for yeah. three months but like just generally kind of going forward how do I make sure that like when something does pop up that I'm interested in I'm kind of like when I've got the experience I'm like mm. the go-to kind I of person. I guess it's like it's, it's being visible you know, it really is being visible. I mean, I, again, I used to say when I used to sort of bombard them with ideas all the time. And it's quite difficult when you're you're in another office, like, you know, I might as well have been on the moon sometimes, even though I was just in Glasgow. Um, and it's that thing of just making sure that they know who you are and you've got ideas. I mean, it's it's that, that's all anybody wants, isn't it? It's ideas, different ideas on different stories. I mean, that, that must be what you want mm. every morning because the news is the news and there it is, but how can we do this a wee bit differently? Yeah. And that's what we do in our show. You know, we, we, we will do Ukraine, but we'll do it maybe in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll do it in a slightly different way that we know that it will resonate with our viewers. So it's, it's that idea. Just keep plugging. Honestly, I know that sounds so annoying, and, and but it's true. Um, you know, like I, I, I should have brought my drawer full of rejection letters just to show you because you, you and I actually think that makes you stronger in some ways. But you know, you're you're good, and if you just keep doing what you're doing, they've got to they've got to recognise that they've got to recognise that. Of course, they have, and it's hard. It's really hard. But what about um, patience as well? As a, as, a, as yeah. an idea. so, I think I sometimes worry that for sort of younger women coming into. Um, journalism, there, there is a, a huge pressure on them that they've got to get to the very, very top. It's actually some of the best fun you're ever going to have yeah. as a journalist is it's, is in the oh early yeah. years where you're out No about, responsibility, you know, really. But, and you're doing, you're out, you're, you're the person that's going to do the interviews, you're mm. on the doorsteps, you're, the, that's the fun stuff. Oh, it is. And so, and to not, to kind of rush the, there's no rush to get to no, the top or. No, there really isn't. It stood me ages. I mean, from 17 till like, you know, early 20s, I was working in the, the newspaper and then, um, after that, you know, I worked as a correspondent for ages. I didn't actually start presenting until I was about 32, mm. 33. Didn't get my own show until I was about 36, 37. So, I mean, you're babies. Yeah. You know, you've got so much time ahead of you. And Alison's absolutely right. There isn't really a rush. I think we all want to pick things very quickly, right now. You yes. Know? And actually, you're right. The, the journey's fun. Yeah, the journey's and great. And it should be. It, sh it should be. You know? Oh, yeah. Don't just do what you're doing, waiting for the end result because you might not get to the end result and you've missed out on having fun on the journey anyway sorry there's another question okay. yeah hi nicola um question on sourcing and verification um uh we live in a, an age where credibility is about <laughs> your source having multiple sources but we also live in an age where there's super injunctions and you know information about people that you're not allowed to re uh, that you're not allowed to report. Have you ever been gagged and how have you managed it? How have you managed that situation? No, I haven't actually. I mean, well, obviously there are certain stories and I'm sure we all know about them in, in this room that we're not allowed to do that because of super injunctions, which I, yeah. <laughs> Um, but what you've touched on is something that I really think is absolutely fundamentally important. And that's the way that things have changed so dramatically. When I, you know, even in local newspapers, and I was in local newspapers or doing shifts in nationals as well, you always had to source things. You, of course you did. And, and we would have got, our editors would have kicked our arses all over the newsroom if we didn't. And now I, I have this, you know, I see this situation all the time and it's really lazy. And I understand the pressures on young journalists. I completely appreciate it. And I think it's scandalous that they are under such pressure. Because two people tweet a lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. They've got zero followers. Twitter storm. You know, and then and and nobody ever says nobody ever gives you a right to reply. I, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about generally, you know, mm. people. I'm not just talking about people in the public eye. I'm talking about everybody. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever gets a right to reply, and that's very very dangerous. You know, it really is, and I'm more worried about that actually than than the kind of super injunction thing. And I'm not talking about silly trivial things. You know, like whether or not you know you're wearing the wrong shoes. That doesn't that doesn't matter at all. It's enormous things that are big, and you know we're giving. As journalists um, and, and responsible people, I, I would like to think, we are giving these keyboard warriors power, huge power, you know? Even if it is a daft wee story because it gets legs and then it runs, you know, and it runs and runs and runs. 
And I, I find that absolutely really disheartening, to be honest. And, you know, I've been a little bit, I think everybody that's in the public eye has been a little bit of a, you know, have had a little bit of that. Um, but we have to get back to the fact that's not, that's really not a story. <laughs> yes. It's no, it's really no, and I, and I think it's really unfair. Um, and of course, I understand the pressures of the twenty four hour news cycle and all the rest of it, and you know the sidebar of, of papers and all of that. You know, we all know about it, but it's it's not fair, and it's not fair on the journalists as well, because that's got to eat away at you. It has, it, it must do. If you're just you know some numpty somewhere, you know, in, in the dirty old underpants sitting <laughs> like that, and and we're giving that person. Mm. the oxygen of our time and and we're making a story out of that it baffles me it baffles me i do i just don't get it and i think we've got to draw away from that a little bit more and that's not the fault of the young kids that are writing the stuff it's not their fault it's the people above them and above them and it, and and i just think it's got to stop i really do i think it's really dangerous mm, very well said and i think we've got one oh i've got two people with their hands yeah. up. Oh, so if i go to that lady first sure. and then and then we'll do you last if that's yes. okay yes. hi hi lorraine nice to meet you um mm. molly um two-parter you're obviously at the top of your game and you've had like a fantastic career is there anything you would have done differently and oh, secondly <laughs> so many. is there anything that you're that you still want to achieve and oh, anywhere gosh. that you sort of um yeah. see yourself going next i mean you're only as good as your last show aren't you and um and luckily we had a very very good one today yeah, so that's, that's good, good. <laughs> that's good and we usually do i mean I, I can't remember last time we had any problems or anything like that but it's great and, and uh, again you know they're just so lucky to do the job um i think now it's different i mean i could never imagine myself when i was when i was a young journalist thinking to myself when you're 62 you will still be on the telly. I mean, that would have been unheard of. You know, it really would. Even back then, I remember when Anne Diamond was pregnant yeah. and she was on the sofa pregnant and there was a hoo-ha because she <laughs> happened to be pregnant. I mean, it's, what do you think about that now? You know, it's nuts. And that makes me feel better because we have got, you know, we've progressed Progress. so, so much and, and come so far. Loads to do. Loads. So much, so much. Give us a little, give us a I little want to sneak. write, I want to, I do want to write. I, I think um, I enjoy that very much. I'd like to do that. I love to do more radio. Mm -hmm. um, but I really, really love what I do. I'm terribly lucky. I never take it for granted. I really don't. Um, and it's, it's such a joy to have so many different people and to see so many different people and to be... To be there in yes. the room, you know, yes. that from Hamilton, the room where it happened. Yeah. But to have that, that's an enormous privilege, a huge privilege. But yeah, loads to do. And absolutely. I don't ever see me retiring. No, never. Oh, no. No. I don't no. think so. So let's just go to the very final question. Hi there, it's Tammy from ITN. Um, you talked about Michael Palin and oh. the fact that he still feels 18 in his head. Yes. And I think there's so many similarities in terms of your curiosity and your ongoing energy. But how old does Lorraine Kelly feel in her head? Oh gosh, how old do I feel? Depends. You know, first thing in the morning, probably 103, and you want to see me. You want to see me first thing in the morning. It's terrifying until lovely Helen puts my makeup on because she's fantastic. Oh my God, did you ever see when, when um, you know, during the COVID, there's something that always makes me laugh. Piers had to put his own makeup on. <laughs> it looked like a mandarin and a satsuma had had sex. And not in a good way. <laughs> really not in a good way. I don't know why that popped into my head, but, but, it, but it did. It did. It was weird. No, so um, yeah, I think. I think I feel. I think I would say, thirty-one. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I like thirty-one because you're. You know. Age. You know a wee bit more about stuff. Yeah, I would say that. <laughs> well, Lorraine, thank you so much. You've been thank absolutely you. fantastic. You've been an inspiration to everybody here, and we can only thank you and carry on going forever oh, and ever and ever. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. No, no, not at all. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and,